Hey everyone, welcome to Over 50 Starting Over. Today, we have special guest Scott Edwards, not to be confused with my brother. Scott is a serial entrepreneur, very interestingly, started his uh, career at the age of 17. He has an absolute fearlessness about entrepreneurialism. And that is what I want you guys to get out of this mostly. Now, we have a whole lot of fun talking about the comedy scene, which I adore. I, I love the art form that uh, stand-up co uh, comics perform and how they creatively get to that point. Uh, Scott owned a string of comedy nightclubs during comedy's renaissance of the, 90, of the 80s. I'm sorry. And so it's very interesting to hear his experiences and how he fired Bill Maher. So we'll get to that. But in the meantime, uh, during all of that, we do have a spirited discussion on politics and what have, has happened with our midterms and uh, just a lot of other things about the industry itself. But I really wanted to arrive at what is special about Scott's take on entrepreneurialism. Why is he fearless? And we got to the root of that matter, I think, I hope, and I hope that you find it fun. Hey, if you want to see more about what I do, my art form, check out edwardscom.net and look at my case studies there. I have tons of them. Click on see all case studies. And I'd love to hear from you, barry at edwardscom.net. Other than that, please go to over50startingover.com, sign up for our email list, get all this as it happens. Hope you enjoy the show. Yeah, Scott, there's only one real theme to the show, and that's trying to get a little bit better every day. So we we do have a couple topics on there about some kind of self-improvement, whether it's career or personal, and we just expound on it. And then the rest of it is having fun and entertainment, be, hanging out with some friends. And that's, you know where it comes from? I've been an avid po podcast listener for about six or seven years now, and I like podcasts where I feel like I'm hanging out with my friends when I'm, you know listening to the conversation, whether I'm at the gym or shopping, walking the dog or something. I, I just really enjoy that. So I try to bring that to our podcast. So when I read about you, I was super, oh, by the way, welcome to Over 50, starting over everyone. I'm Barry Edwards. And uh, this is Scott Edwards, who incidentally has the same name as my brother. Hey! Isn't that awesome? You must be a really uh, amazing Handsome, a, fun guy. He is. He truly is. As are you. And ah, well, thank you, but I'm married. Oh, okay. Well, we can just end the podcast early then. There's no point <laughs> in continuing. Yeah, this is the the weirdest start to a podcast. We 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 had some uh, audio issues, and oh, now we're like, oh, we're well, here. Yes, yes. So glad Very. glad that we are because I've been really looking forward to this. Because well, I have been too. I've been listening to some of your podcasts. Same. And I was trying to fix what the reason you started explaining the way you did is I'm trying to fix on the topic so that I could bring some real uh, uh -huh. interest and, and, and excitement to your show. But I listened to like three or four podcasts and I'm still like, <laughs> Barry's pretty right. much, you know, depending on his mood. Yes. Well, and you're absolutely right. But let me tell you exactly why I wanted you to come on so bad is entrepreneurially you are a phenom i got a lot of questions for you in that regard you are and what i hadn't heard from you yet and then of course the other side of it is i love stand-up comedy it's an art i'm a commercial artist i have no gift in that realm whatsoever but as an art form like i like listening to bill burr he just had on bill maher just last week, very interesting. Boy, Bill Maher, he's uh, got a thin skin. Um, I uh, fired his ass. <laughs> we're going to get back to that. <laughs> but I, and, and Rogan, when he has uh, other comedians on there, first of all, comedians have to generally be a little more exceptionally intelligent, perceptive than the average person in order to to talk for an hour interestingly you know it so well, and, and i don't that, know if i'd put it in that regard but they are okay. really good at engaging with people yeah especially strangers that uh, that a lot of people don't have that gene that don't true. have that ability mm. um now i'm also um as you mentioned i'm a lifelong entrepreneur i've started over a dozen companies but i think the same um interaction with people salespeople have to have yes 
Yes. Right. So, you know, I've always been a, a salesman and yet that also worked for me on stage. I could talk to strangers all day long and that's something that uh, uh, some personalities don't have the ability to do. Well, I totally agree with that. I, it's not a gift of mine either. Uh, I just <laughs> no, <Ooh. laughs> but, but it's truly not. And back to the 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 thing about comedians, I said they generally have to be more intelligent. Uh, but I mean a, pers- a unique perspective. You know, I don't look. Bill Burr is no genius, uh, and he'll admit that he's so self-deprecating. But he's got a delivery. Look, some are great storytellers. And Larry Miller was the best. I'm not, I don't know Larry Miller. If, you, if you, your audience goes to the Googler and puts in Larry Miller, you go, oh, that guy. He's done oh. over 100 movies and TV oh. shows. But on stage as a comic, uh, and I don't know if it would work. It's interesting, Barry. I don't know if it would work in today's audience because there's such a short attention span. Yeah. But he could tell a 15, 20-minute joke and have you laugh a story. Mm-hmm. and just have you laughing all the way through. I don't know how that would work in today's uh, short-minded uh, audience, but uh, he was a genius when it came to stand-up comedy. Okay, wait a minute. Let us let's let, let me push back on that a little bit. Where, where do you think Dave uh, Ch- Chappelle stands in there? Because I think that he's a storyteller. But it's just, it's just the technique. So um, there's there's monologist, you know, there's all these different types of art. Stand up comedy is an art form. Mm -hmm. So you got Stephen Wright, that's slow, joke, joke, Mm -hmm. joke. You got Robin Williams is the other end of the spectrum. He throws out 20 things, hoping six or eight land. Right. Kind of that machine gun mentality. You got Jerry Seinfeld or Gary Shandling uh, that would be conversationally. Uh, where there's kind of a, um, you know, a normal topic that's called observational comedy, and they can expand on it, make it into a um, one minute, two minute comedy bit. But then you have people like uh, Larry Miller, that could do a a long five minute bit. That's a story that is really funny. His two famous ones are the 12 stages of drinking and going (laughs) snow skiing. But you know, he's just one of my favorites. There, like you said, there's a lot of people that can spin a story, but I was just, if, like I said, if you go to the Google and you hit Larry Miller, you mm-hmm. go, Oh, that guy he's been, uh, he was a suck up guy in the movie, pretty woman. That was his first big, God, I don't even remember that movie. <laughs> uh, who Harry, who, too much drugs. Uh, I smoked way too much pot when I was a kid. Who, I wanted to get to this question at some point. Who do you think in your experience was the most naturally gifted comedian that didn't have to actually work hard of it, hard at it versus who do you think worked hardest at his craft? Well, Barry, that is a very complicated question. I've worked with literally hundreds of comics, famous and not so famous. Mm-hmm. And um, when you say naturally gifted, again, it, it depends on what they're doing. Jay Leno can just talk to people and find the funny, right? Um, I had him in several concerts. He would do a 60, 90 minute show. And there was definitely written material for maybe half an hour. But the other yeah. hour, he's just riffing with the audience. And you have to be naturally funny to do oh, that. Yeah. Robin Williams was like a Rolodex. He had a head of all this stuff he'd heard and thought so that when he interacted with the audience, his mind instantly went to the five things that he knew were funny about that topic. So that that was a little bit of genius or craziness there. But Jerry Seinfeld, uh, Will Schreiner, Paul Reiser, there's a lot of guys that um, had the ability to... um, spin a story or tell a joke Mm -hmm. and um, not have to work as hard. As far as somebody that had to work hard, there's a lot of, you know, opening act, feature acts, uh, unknown headliners that make a point. Uh, One of my favorites is a young man named Steve Bruner, who Mm -hmm. uh, makes a point. He has like writing classes once or twice a week 
but he's performing every weekend. He's been a professional comic for over 30 years, has had a great career, never got famous, but had a great life. But he makes a point of writing all the time. Um, I was just talking to Dennis Blair, who toured with uh, uh, George Carlin. And he was saying that uh, George Carlin, as a comic, had that mix where he did a lot of writing, but he was able to, like Jay Leno, riff and kind of come up with things while on stage. So wow. there's really all these different levels uh, to answer your question, which I did horribly. Oh, no, I thought you did a really good job. Now, I thought Carlin, like I watched some old Car old Carlin tape and I think, my God, this guy worked his butt off continuously. Be he was speaking so fast, spitting out fact after fact after fact. I mean, did he really ha just have that stored as an encyclopedia in his head or did he like I imagine that he just worked his material so much over and over again that it became muscle reflex, but it was so much material. I'm saying I thought it looked to me like he worked really hard. He, he did. But what a lot of people uh, don't realize is that when you saw it, it seems fresh and it seems like he just thought of it. That's yeah. the acting part of being a stand up comic. The reality is he had probably done that set you know, 20 or 30 times in, in smaller clubs or in in mm -hmm. uh, what you might call rehearsal process in front of smaller audiences, honing the material and finding out which words or which statements really grabbed an audience. Uh, there's this um, misimpression of an audience that the talent of the comic makes it sound like, oh, I just thought of that. When oh. the reality is, is they'd rehearsed it and practiced it probably a hundred times. Oh, for sure. And they find out what, where to lean in on something because it's hitting better with the audience. And the best ones will say that they always tape their acts, every act oh, and go back. And it's, I've agree. written two books on being a stand up comic. And one of the things I always say is record your sets. Uh, and if you can video, but mm -hmm. definitely audio, because you never know what's magically going to come out. And, you know, what's interesting about the art form and Barry, you mentioned an appreciation for stand up comedy as an art form it, is that one word or one nuance or one inflection in your voice. Yes can make a huge difference in how it impacts an audience. And I like what you said, because comedians talk about this a lot today is now with Netflix specials, they got to, I mean, if you're a comedian worth his salt, you're starting over all the time because when a special comes out, everyone's seen your material. So you got to come up with all new material again. I mean, in the old days, those comics that you were uh, bringing up along the way, they're doing their same act over and over again for years. Right, right. And they're getting it down pat. But I'll tell you an interesting side story that a lot of the guys I work with, I'm in central California in a town, small town called Sacramento. <laughs> and a lot of the comics would build up their material in San Francisco and the Bay Area was kind of a comedy hub. But what's interesting is, if they wanted to get on TV or make that next level jump in their career, they would go to LA or New York and guess what? You're starting over. You have to reprove yourself, yeah. Yeah. right? The club owners, Mitzi Shore, uh, who was one Famous. of my peers. Yeah. yeah. Mitzi Shore or, or Bud Friedman at the improv, you had to showcase and do, you know, an open mic. You may have been doing comedy for five years in San Francisco when you went to a hub like New York or LA, you're starting over. Right. All right. So we can come back to this fun stuff that I really, I could talk about this all day. It's just a, a big comedy is a big interest of mine again, because of the art, art form. But what I was really struck with you about, and I really can't wait to dive into this. And this is the value for our O five O uh, listeners, as we say here, your entrepreneurial drive that started at a very young age. And I'm surprised that you're still in Sacramento. That's where you launched your first comedy club, as I remember. Is that correct? Oh, okay. what amazing memory you have. Here. I do. It's, 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 it's like an elephant. And it's uh, on the notes in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you started, now your entrepreneurial career starts out with con a construction company kind of quickly, 
uh, morphs into the whole, I shouldn't say morphs into, but geez, you had a disco, you had the uh, comedy clubs, uh, uh, I think around the country. You had three? Okay. And the last thing I know about is you had a freaking submarine. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, I had a submarine. <laughs> I had a beach shack in Hawaii. Um, uh, I was a um, uh, car buyer and seller in uh, for Ford as a uh, uh, commercial specialist. And I recently just uh, sold and retired from the insurance industry. I was an insurance broker for the last uh, 15 years. Uh, but what's interesting about over 50, I'm 67 now. I just sold my great. business. <laughs> oh, thanks you again. I, I I have a woman. <laughs> uh, and uh, the uh, um, but even though I just sold my insurance agency and 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 have plenty of cash, um, and I'm still acting as a um, consultant for the guy that bought me out. I went and started another company just uh, three months ago. So I what is have, that? I have. I'm sorry. What is the company? What do you? What is well. Do? I've been doing podcasting for about two and a half years as kind of a fun hobby mm -hmm. about comedy and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I realized the value of being able to reach people. And so um, my business experience and my insurance agency and everything I did in the automotive industry was in a small town south of Sacramento called Elk Grove, California. Mm -hmm. uh, so a suburb. And I've created a podcast just for that suburb called heard it here uh that's because they their high school mo um what it, mascot is the um an elk hurt and they go by the herd h-e-r-d uh -huh. so i did a podcast called heard it here and i interview small business owners they get three minutes for free to share about their company and then the residents can go to the podcast and learn about their fellow business people and why should i go to Bob's restaurant versus Joe's restaurant, right? Now, as a marketer myself, I and obviously podcaster, I'd suggest if you haven't done this yet, is you should put this on a website with a blog page for each of the episodes that people can comment. And it'd be, you know, really great to get ratings. It'd be like almost live ratings from uh, from an audience. It's not a bad idea. No, okay. that's a great idea. And I do have a Facebook page where people can collect likes and comments through the podcast, but the um, web page hasn't been created yet. This is a new project that just launched, mm. and I'm working with the city of Elk Grove through their Shop Local program. Mm. So the idea is to share information about the businesses, but I think you're right. It could be uh, expanded on by including comments and ratings of various companies, uh, uh, very, very, I I took notes, Barry. Uh, I'm glad you did. Now, just to note, audience, this is the kind of stuff I do. That's kind of why it came top of mind. Uh, okay, let's, before, now nah, let's go here. I'm going to get back to Bill Maher. <laughs> I want to get back to Bill Maher, but not yet, because I've been dying to go here. I haven't heard you speak of this. You started, your entrepreneurial mojo kicked off at like 17 years old. What in your life, how were you raised? What, tra what transpired in your life? Or were you just born that way? Like what advantages did you have? Well, so like most kids, I was mowing lawns or babysitting and, yeah. and uh, doing uh, odd jobs when I was, you know, I think since I was 12, um, by the time I was 15, I was working. My parents had divorced when I was 10. My mom was struggling financially. So I went to work at the age of 15 and got a driver's license early because of my need to work. Um, but the the short answer is when I worked for other people, I always got fired. <laughs> <laughs> you so got fired you, from your lawn mowing job. <laughs> yeah. So how do you not get fired? You be the boss. Right. All right. So but I got to tell you. You shocked, you shocked me right there. I thought for sure you were going to say, wow, I just happened to have two amazing parents that stayed together that encouraged me to, you know, they had Inc. magazine laying around and this, that, or the other. I was sure you're going to say that you came from a broken home. Like, yeah, it, it, doesn't... Was, it was more out of necessity, but the entrepreneurial side, I think really was, uh, it has to be deep in my genes because I'm not sure 
why it happened. So the quick story about my first company was I was a night janitor at a sleazy motel. So I'm mopping floors, fixing toilets and that kind of thing in the middle of the night and going to school during the day. Wow. And uh, I was hiding from the boss in the bar. I was only 17, wasn't supposed to be there. And I overheard two guys in the bar talking and this guy saying, wow, uh, on the weekends, I'm painting lines in parking lots and I get some good extra cash. I can bring in an extra 500 a week. Well, to a 17-year-old, $500 a week is a fortune. It's a lot of money. So um, I had no money, uh, but I had a buddy that had just come into a huge inheritance of $500. And I convinced him, a high school buddy, to buy a painting machine. You know, we painted the lines in parking lots. It's called striping. And... <laughs> We had this machine and we we I had gone out and talked to people in the industry. That's my advice to anybody out there. You want to get into business. There's no reason to recreate the wheel. Go out and talk to people already doing it. So I'd already gone out to striping companies and asked, what do they charge? You know, how do they do it? You know, where do they get their business? And, and people love talking about their success and their own business. So I Good just point. gleaned information off of them. But I had this machine. I had my buddy and I. And we didn't have any way to get to the jobs. So I'm the salesman. He's the grunt. And we had a third high school buddy that happened to have a van. So he so became a third a partner. partner. <laughs> and so, you know, my one friend had a machine. One friend had a van. And I had the sales skills. I had no fear of going out and talking to people. But that little company called a, &A Restripe. Um, gave all three of us an income. I was able to negotiate a, a contract with uh, McDonald's. We did all the McDonald's in Northern California. Jeez. And what was great is not only were we making a little bit of money, but I arranged free food at every stop. So you're 17 and you're getting free burgers, all you can eat at every McDonald's. Uh. I mean, there's no, you know, there's no surprise I'm 100 pounds overweight, right? It was, it was a great adventure when we were 17 but by 18 and a half i was ready for the next thing so i sold out now my the partner that owned the van he and his children still run that company today wow yeah it's still going on the other weird thing if your audience is ready for the woo, sure spooky stuff my next company was called sounds good music we were spinning records and playing disco before disco. So don't hate me. Um, look, for example, uh, everybody knows that disco really took off after the movie Saturday Night Fever with John Travolta. Well, we were playing that music months before the movie came out. And then when disco went big, we were putting discos and dance floors into restaurants like Steak and Ale and, and some of the right. others, right? And so I was a DJ bouncer and I used to teach disco dancing at the angel <laughs> flight pants and the, the big thing. So I'm aging myself here, but sounds good music. My partner in that was the brother of the guy that does a and a restripe. And wow. that company just closed due to his retirement uh, three years ago. So sounds good. Music was able to provide him a life and an income for you know 30 40 years that's really interesting so there is a construction end to your disco company is that correct you said well, so you start putting in floors in other places yeah i mean with a, a restripe i was you know it started off by just painting lines yeah but we, you know in the business you learn all of a sudden you have to add asphalt or put in tire uh -huh. bumpers or whatever so you learn some of the arts of construction when in the Sounds Good Music, we were spinning records for weddings and bar mitzvahs and birthdays, and we would go into schools and have dance parties, right? Mm -hmm. um, but when disco went really hot, the nightclubs uh, wanted to bring that in. The restaurants wanted to bring it in and become a nightclub. So we knew how to put together a sound system, and it wasn't that hard to find a dance floor and you know put it in. So there was kind of a mix it was mostly about the music but we did a little bit of construction and and uh uh and then the the gentleman that kept the business for the next 40 years he made his money mostly off of weddings and dance parties and birthdays 
Uh, he, you know, and he spun vinyl records all the way up to a few years ago. He never okay. went digital. Wow. Let me ask you this. Is this a theme that you've carried throughout your entrepreneurial career? And that is that you develop strong relationships with key people and you just bring them along on your various adventures? Because that's how it started. Pretty much. You know, um, my third company was the one we talked about in 1980. I opened up Laughs Unlimited, a all comedy showroom. Let me wait a minute. Let me ask you something. Is this because disco all of a sudden, boom, died? Right. Well, it was actually right before the drop of disco. But it's interesting because when I opened my club, it was the 12th in the entire U.S., that full time comedy club. And that was August of 1980. Uh, my opening act, making one hundred and fifty dollars for a week worth of work was gary shandling everybody knows that name and uh but five years later fast forward five years later disco has died comedy's having this huge boom i'm riding that wave and all the discos were now becoming comedy clubs that's what i thought right right? so um it used to when i opened there was 12 full-time clubs in the country by 1985 it was like starbucks there in every corner right yeah, I, the comedy I, had this really good wave of respect and entertainment, and uh, but that you know that waned too. You know, by 1991 there was a recession, and mm. comedy had been kind of overexposed and it was dropping off. But uh, it was an exciting ride. Well, I got a theory on that one, and you could just ask the cast of Saturday Night Live. I think many would attest to this. I mean, think about the excesses of the 80s. All right. The whole lot of cocaine going around. And I think that made a lot of good comedians uh, that when they finally got sober, they weren't so good anymore. You know, some some went that route. So that's what you you say that they got overexposed. I think they just cooked themselves over the 80s. Well, the only problem with your theory, Barry, is that um, stand up comedy, when it got really hot, one of the downsides was that everybody thought if they could come up with three minutes of material, they'd get a sitcom. And oh, so right. every Tom, Dick, and Harry thought they would be a good stand-up comic. And that really thinned out the level of quality comedy, mm. right? The people I'm working with in 1980, 1981, and 82 are Bob Saget, Dave Coulier, George Wallace, Gary Shandling, Jerry Seinfeld, Jay Leno, Dana Carvey. I mean, these guys were really working at their art form before everybody uh, thought they could be funny. And so when you're thinning out the quality of the entertainment, that affected what you're saying, brought kind of a slowdown to the art form by 1990. Well, it's interesting because all those names that you mentioned, I don't really think that they were partaking in the over excess lifestyle. No, no. And and to be honest, you know, you're you're absolutely correct that the two things that uh, brought an end to too many careers. And we, it happened in music too, you know, uh, Jimi Hendrix and many others, but it was drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm. So when, when you're working a comedy club and the club's giving you free alcohol and you have to sit around and wait for an hour to get on stage, uh, there's a lot of drinking going on. And then of course, cocaine was huge in the eighties. And so there was a lot of um, bad habits started but at my club i'm kind of old school i didn't do drugs myself they made me afraid and i had rules about using drugs now that didn't keep a very talented uh, road comic by the name of john fox uh who actually chased me around the green room once with a spoonful of coke going come on you can do it you know but uh uh so things like that happen but you know it it um as you mentioned, it did affect the industry. I don't know if I agree with you that it killed the industry. For example, we both know Cheech and Chong. Oh, yeah. uh, they they built a career on marijuana, which you know it's so different today than it was fifty years ago. To say we the were, least. you know, we were smoking ragweed, right? You could yeah. smoke three joints and maybe get high. Right now, you take one puff of the high THC stuff and you're gone. Right. But. Uh, uh, Tommy Chung worked for me twice later in his life. 
um, in the in the late '90s, and um, he was still really funny, still really brought it to the stage. He connected. Uh, he had a famous song called "Earache My Eye," and he would play it, bring out his electric guitar, and play it live on stage. It was amazing. Oh, it's fantastic. For those that don't remember, look up Earache My Eye. Dun, I don't remember that dun, one. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, it was amazing. Huh. I got goosebumps when he played it on my stage. No kidding. I will have to look that up. Do you have any good Seinfeld stories? Jerry was um, a really solid entertainer. You mentioned he was one of the early uh, true professionals mm -hmm. that wrote. Uh, he's a monologist, but he wrote um, a observational comedy. So there's mm -hmm. different kinds of comedy prop comedy, music comedy, you know, you name it. Uh, the very esoteric Paula Poundstone, Emo Phillips, right? Something kind of weird. But uh, Jerry Seinfeld had a way of talking about life and making it and pointing out the absurdity or the funny in everyday life. One of my favorite early bits, just because it's it makes a perfect definition of what he did. He talked about men's pajamas. Mm -hmm. well, everybody had seen you know dick van dyke on tv or or had their dad wearing men's pajamas and he's like pointing out we have a breast pocket what's that for we have cuffs on our men's pajamas and and stuff that people had seen forever but never realized yeah that's pretty weird that's pretty funny right right, right. so jerry had a real art for that but what my great jerry seinfeld story is he was a regular at my club when he first came out from uh, new york and he um, had to cancel a week with me because he got the Seinfeld show. Oh, wow. And the first season, it was called Seinfeld Chronicles. It, it was bad. great, but it ended up taking off. Yeah. But what was amazing about Jerry was that usually once these guys have a sitcom, um, I won't say they all become prima donnas, but they, they don't need me anymore, right? Right, right? My clubs are like university. You're learning and training. And then mm. once you get into what I call the golden ticket and you have your own show or you're doing movies, you don't really need a club like mine. Well, Jerry was such a gentleman and such a, a, a great guy that after he had done the Seinfeld show for a year, he called me up and he goes, Hey, I owe you a week. And he came wow. back and worked for the same money that he had canceled on a year earlier. You gotta be kidding me. That's, I mean, that's, that's a stand up incredible. Guy. You know, I got a, Seinfeld observation myself I recall about about 10 years ago he was the first one I read about that said I'll never do a university again he goes I'm done with colleges they, they just they take the funny out of it they get offended by everything that he was the first one that I know that I know of that went down that road and that yeah, says a lot about what's going on today it's really horrible about this uh quote-unquote counterculture woke society that it is that you used to be able to go into a college university. I used to book a bunch of them and the kids just wanted to have fun. And, yep. and uh, you know, you, you, you poke fun at life. That's what comedy is. And now in this day and age, you know, you got some snowflake that gets offended when you, you say blue instead of yellow yep. and it's just ridiculous. And I'm glad that he came out and made that statement, but mm -hmm. there's really hard to find any comics that will even work a college anymore and it's it's too bad uh, i i can't see why any comic would want to work a college unless you were just bought into the woke movement and you're not going to be funny if you're censoring everything that you say and playing by a rule right. book stand that's anti comedy, right and barry stand-up comedy is the last bastion of free speech if you can't go out and say what you want to say as an as your vision of how life's going Whatever people agree or don't agree, if it's funny, mm. that's okay. It's got to be funny. You can't just right. be a lot of F-bombs and I hate the world kind of thing. <laughs> but if you don't let college kids experience that freedom of speech, I think you're taking away part of their education. Oh, I mean, I, I'm probably overstating it. But no, I you're not. You know what I mean. No, you're not. Let me put it to you this way, because I didn't know how to articulate this. A free speech is kind of like one of those axioms that we most of us have forgotten how to define, talk about. Why is it so important? Well, Jordan Peterson put it best, and he said, a, a com comedians today are like the canaries in the coal mines. And when people start going after artists and comedians, you know, free speech is being threatened. Now, you know, want to know what's wrong with that? What is 
The big problem with that is free speech is the only tool the oppressed have to fight their oppression. And so now what you got are people that are claiming that they're oppressed, oppressing other people with the, the freedom of speech. It's a horrible, hypocritical thing that's going on. I think it's dangerous. Oh, you're you're so right. It's uh, I mean, look at uh, Don Rickles. I mean, he was mm -hmm. a huge comedy star, TV, movies, but he couldn't entertain today because his theory was I'm going to pick on everybody because we're all humans. And yeah. if I pick on everybody from the black guy to the Jew, it brings us all together because we're laughing at ourselves. Right. 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 Don Rickles would not last you know, five minutes in today's society, even though right. his theory and his type of comedy had value, if you took it for what it is, you know, if you can't laugh at yourself, you're, you're, you're not going to make it through life. You I, know, I, all these, uh, well, I don't, I'm going to get on a soapbox, but you got all okay. these woke counterculture, young people, let's say under 30, I'm, I'm gauging a little bit, I'm judging a little bit, mm -hmm. but they uh, were all, you know, everybody got a, a trophy. Everybody is a winner. Everyone go. has to succeed and all their feelings matter. And you know what? Bullshit. Right. You know what? If there's 50 people in the room and you get offended, screw you. The 49 right. people matter. No, so but as it's... a producer, you know, just, just to make the point, as a comedy producer, whether I'm doing a concert, a TV show, or my comedy club shows, there's no way you're going to make everybody in the audience happy all the time. You're hoping over the space of a show that everybody enjoys themselves. But if one or two or even a table full of uh, people get offended and the rest of the audience is having a great time, as the producer, I care about the audience, not those four people. Well, I know I, that sounds mean and harsh, I, but you know I, what? If you can't take it, get the hell out of the comedy club. For sure. You know, what are you doing going out if you're offended by everything? If you're such a snowflake, you know, yeah. live with your, you know, live with your cats and your little hubble and okay. leave the rest of the world alone. Okay, it, I'm done. No, that's great. I, I love what you said. I think comedians by today's stand or yesterday's standards, if they didn't offend a table full of people out of that whole audience, they didn't do their job well. You know, right. that's, that's kind of the gauge. You didn't well, want to offend everybody, but you want to you want to take turns. Actually, what you want to do is offend these people this time on your next joke, offend these people on the exact opposite side. So and so, so you're not Barry, picking a real side. You're just exposing the ridiculousness. Right. And it's just to share with the audience. Um, it's been calculated that I probably had more stage time than any comic because I am seed all my shows. So, you know, six nights a week, 10 shows a week, I'm emceeing, and I never wrote a joke. I'm not a comic, uh, but a lot of people think I'm funny because as an MC, my job is to get the audience focused, got to get them loose, get them laughing. And how did I do that? By interacting with the audience, mm -hmm. you know, oh, hey, you know, what do you do for a living? Well, I'm a farmer. Oh, yeah, I saw the tractor parked out front. I'll talk slower, right? <laughs> or, you know... Uh, you're a lawyer. Oh, you're a crook. Good. Right. Yeah. So if they can't take that light picking on that makes the rest of the audience laugh. Yeah, that's their problem in my mind. But, I, sure. but I was doing it for the entertainment of everybody to bring us all together. And I think that the, the newer woke generations don't realize that we're all human. We all have piccadillies. We have things that that we all do that are stupid and wrong and if you can't laugh at those uh and you take them serious you're going to be a neurotic <laughs> for sure well there's a lot of that going around today yeah. but i also believe that the environment that's being created today and it's it's kind of overdue for the pendulum to swing the other way it's it, we're creating an extremely fertile environment for up and coming comedians to start offending people when 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 they get daring again well, Don't you think? It, it, yeah, I think I, you're absolutely correct, Barry. I think the pendulum is starting to quit, mm. you know, swing back. I think a lot of people are tired of the whole woke, everybody's offended yeah. thing. Yeah. Uh, there's more and more people like me that, you know, it's about the majority. It's about everybody being right. together. And we can't worry about every individual because there's always somebody that's got a thin skin or a weird. Really want know, attention. 
They just really yeah. want attention. There you, you know? go. But uh, let's hope that you're right and uh, it comes back strong. And it doesn't necessarily have to be insult comedy. There's a lot of very funny people that were a little hard hitting. Uh, a good friend of mine, Bobby Slayton, called the pit bull of comedy, uh, could be a little hard hitting. Bob Saget, who oh, yeah. uh, you know was famous for Full House yeah. on stage, was absolutely filthy, savage, was yeah, really funny, yeah, right, and uh, and very well you know, loved by other comedians. He really oh, yeah. was. Yeah. yeah, Bob was a, a great, great man. In fact, uh, Dave Couillet and Bob Saget really helped me get started. Uh, one of my first TV commercials in 1981 was um, written and, and performed by Bob Saget. And and uh, uh, I'll, I'll send you a copy if you want to see. I would love to see it. That was um, uh, amazing that he was able to do that. But... Um, <clears throat> Really what Bob Saget and Dave Coulier, by the way, good friends. Dave was at my bachelor party when I got married and uh, Bob and I uh, stayed in contact over the years. Um, they helped. They wanted to see me succeed. So they would help me like who to book. They introduced me to people like Gary Shandling and George Wallace. Oh, you have time for a quick story? Absolutely. This this will uh, your uh, fans will enjoy this. So Bob Saget's already a regular at my club. He's already headlining. Uh, unlike Gary Shandling that had to work his way up to headliner, mm -hmm. Bob was already headlining. A very, very funny guy. A little dirty. A lot of people don't know. He was a comic musician. He used to do a lot of music on stage. But he uh, said, hey, I'm going to bring a friend up for a week. And I said, Bob, anything for you. So Bob brings this guy up from L.A. And uh, we we work with him for a whole week. Bob's writing material for him. I'm teaching him how to use a mic, where to look, and how you know what it's like on stage. And it turns out there was a new TV show called Bosom Buddies, and the guy had to do a comedy set on the show. If you don't haven't figured it out, it was Tom Hanks. Wow! And Tom right. Hanks worked my club for a week for free is he learned how to be a comic and Bob Saget wrote material for him. And what was really rewarding Barry was that like 10 days later, the bosom buddies show aired and we got to see the comedy set that we prepared on TV. It was really exciting. Oh God, it's an amazing story. Now let me ask you something about By the that. way, for your audience. Yeah. He wasn't the Tom Hanks then. Of course that not. Bosom Buddies was his first show. It wasn't a huge hit. It was only right. on for a couple of years. But, you know, now he's Tom Hanks. Back yeah, then, and he, he Tom Hanks. He famously kind of went through Cleveland, too, doing a stint at one of those comedy uh, workshop kind of things. He, he was here for quite a while doing that. But let me ask you this, because we can say for sure, Tom Hanks has a special quality about him that he's very lovable. No matter what he does, he's very connecting. Do you think that you share a similar quality that has made you a very good salesman and entrepreneur? Well, I would certainly not ever put me in the, any sort of same classification as Tom Hanks. But I think there is some truth to the fact that if you're an A personality, that you're able to talk to anybody. You know, I can walk up to a, a 90 year old woman or a a uh, pissed off 20 year old black kid or uh, uh, um, the Hispanic next door neighbor or and in, in other words, there there is an ability to not be afraid to talk to anybody about anything. Mm -hmm. And right. you do need a certain personality. Then what I have found is that I have my father had a great sense of humor. He was a traveling salesman, always had a joke. Right. And I, I'm not like that. I don't tell jokes per se, um, but that personality rubbed off on me, I think. And if you combine the lack of fear of talking to strangers and then you add humor, it does make you personable. Yeah, for sure. So I, I don't think I have any special unique gift, yeah. but I do. Uh, well, my wife would say I have the gift of gab. She kind of you know, do you have sure. to be the best friend of every waiter that serves us? 
See, I think that's an amazing personality, but I think that permeates through all those other aspects of your personality that we're talking about. Let me ask you this back to those comedy clubs. You're managing all these at a young age, I would say, for the amount of responsibility that you had. Yeah, that's really young. Uh, So you're managing like you got this relation. You feel out this relationship with your audience, which is your prime, your prime audience. But you got to manage an entire staff, which is a whole different set of what's the word mental condition you know they're they're right here at a, a everyday level your 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 audience that's coming in is at a heightened level of superficialness kind of but it, we mean that in a good way but then you're managing the egos of the performers themselves am i missing anyone this is a lot of ground to cover for a 24 year old i think it was a, an incredible learning experience So I ended up with three clubs, 125 employees. And what a lot of people don't think about when they go to a comedy nightclub is it's not just a comedy show that I'm quote unquote producing where I have to pick the talent, who fits together, the timing, then I MC the shows. But you're running a bar because you're serving drinks to everybody. But you have to serve food. So you have a, a, a small restaurant. So you have to combine you in my case, I learned by the seat of my pants and and made a lot of mistakes, but I learned how to be a restaurateur. I learned how to be a bartender. I was already a producer. And that was a value to me later on, because as the money flew in in the 80s, which was a good time financially, I ended up opening a couple pure restaurants. One Mm. was a a Mm. restaurant slash jazz club. And one was just a barbecue restaurant because I love barbecue. Yeah. Um, I love the arts. I ended up owning a couple of art galleries hmm. and I ran all this for 21 years. So I had lots of time to make mistakes and I was rich a couple of times. I was dead broke and bankrupt a couple of times. Uh, I've been sued. I've had the government come after me. I mean, anything that can happen to an entrepreneur is what's going to happen to you. Hmm. And you just to have have to be consistent and persistent to work your way through those things and learn from them. Mm-hmm. And I think that I might have a um, the ability. <laughs> Luckily, I learned from my mistakes. If I if I made a mistake twice, that's bad on me. Yeah, right. Making it once, that's just being naive. But you know, then I went on. I I, I did own a submarine for a few years. It was in. Uh, Monterey. It turned out it didn't work well. It was a huge financial failure, but I had a whole lot of fun. About what years was was that? Because I'm thinking uh, I saw this on YouTube a few years ago. It was it 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 was called the Nautilus Four. There was already one in Hawaii that I helped launch. There was a company that I was involved with called Snuba, which Mm -hmm. is underwater snorkeling. I was one of the owners, and the guys that own that developed these submarines. And they had one in Hawaii and they had one in Mexico. And so I said, I want one of those. And so I got some partners and we had the summary in Monterey. The reason it failed is even though there was the sea otters and the sea lions and the kelp yeah. forest and all the great fish, it was too cold. And so the algae bloom would cover the windows and people couldn't see the sea life. Mm. So I had to pay a diver all the time to be there cleaning the windows while people are trying to enjoy the ocean. It just didn't work financially. We ended up selling the submarine to the Wrigley gum family and it, it still operates, but out of Catalina Island, okay, in Southern California. But even during that time, I was still experimenting and having fun opening companies. I had a beach shack in Hawaii for five years uh, at the King Kamehameha hotel and we sold sunscreen and we rented out kayaks And I got to tell you, as a single, I was about 30, 29, 30 then, uh, I was single, and all these uh, uh, semi-clad women on the beach, it was a horribly tough job. Well, that's, I was thinking about, your jobs were fun. I mean, a lot of hard work. Very different, though. Like, I was thinking about when you had all these different comedy clubs, you're managing uh, bars and restaurants, I wanted to ask you, are you good at delegating? Are yeah. you oh, oh, okay? And that's really you, important. You have to, you know, so, and I want everyone to understand that, that uh, yes, I have an ego and yes, 
you have to have a really strong personality right or wrong there's a where the buck stops here decision maker mm -hmm. and i made a lot of decisions that were right and wrong but i stood by my decisions and and that's something that's important for an entrepreneur but it is true that any successful business person so you know i'm, I'm running the three clubs there's no way i can be at all three at once so I booked them, I oversaw them, I visited them on a regular basis, I emceed at all of them at one time or another, but I had to delegate to people that I trained to, to run my operations. I had people I knew that ran my restaurants. Uh, the Beach Shack in Hawaii had a partner. I was still running businesses in California, so I would fly over to Hawaii three or four times a year, but my partner really ran the business. I would just go in for the fun. Okay. And, you know, the submarine, I, I I had to have people that were way smarter than me uh, actually operating the submarine. I'm not licensed for that. You know, I got to drive it because I owned it, but I never took tourists. That would be against the law. Mm -hmm. um, you have to be licensed to operate a, a vessel of any tonnage uh, with people on it. So um, you you hit the nail on the head, Barry. I had fun. And I think so that, important. Yeah, I think anybody young or old that's, you know, you mentioned being over 50 and what's next. Um, you got to just do things that make you happy. Yeah, I've had a lot of money and I've been dead broke. I've never held either very long. It's mm -hmm. always been yeah. just surviving. Right. But yeah. I had so many great experiences and yeah. so much fun that even when I failed, like the submarine, who can who can say they owned a submarine and got to drive it and I, I my kids got a chance to go on it and stuff i mean those are memories and something in my past that even though i lost you know $100,000 or more it was you know it was worth it i mean i, yeah. I you know financially it was stupid right. but for a personal experience it was invaluable i th I, I do you see business as a game that you like playing uh, I haven't looked at it as or ever called it a game, but it is. Yeah. I mean, you're, it's it's the game of risk. Yeah. Oh, right? you're, a you're a gambler. Huh? You're a gambler. Yeah. That's what it is. I'm trying to get at your motivation and what breaks through the intimidation. Most of us wouldn't do half of what you've done because we'd be too afraid. And uh, I, You know what, Barry? Gambler is a good uh mm. It's funny because in real life, I do gamble occasionally, but I'm not like a gambler. I don't mm -hmm. sit and play poker for days or put away hundreds of, I still play quarter machines. You know, I'm okay. very cheap, uh -huh. but it is gambling. And I think if I could give any advice to anybody that's listening is you have to gamble and take the risk on yourself. I always had the ego and the personality that I believed in me. And that whatever I went into, whether it was construction, disco, comedy, uh, car sales or insurance or a submarine or a beach check, whatever I was doing, that I was confident, right or wrong, I still had that ego and confidence uh, that I'm going to take this risk because it's going to be fun for me. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now I think that's very interesting. You could juxtapose that against somebody like a Donald Trump. And I want to say pre-president Donald Trump. So everybody calm down, but I'm talking, <laughs> just talking about the businessman that wrote some books. He would always be like, Oh, don't, don't gamble with your own money. Gamble with your investors money. But you're, you're, he went to Harvard or something. He went to some Ivy league school, business school, you're just the guy that got to, barely got to high school, right? And started yeah, your own businesses. Yeah, so I it's kind of natural that you just have that adventurous entrepreneurial spirit. And it, you want know some funny, Barry? Mm -hmm. I was never smart enough to use the other guy's money. I mean, I, yeah, I, there was some friends I pulled in and stuff that, right. I, that helped me get started. But everything I did was seat of the pants, like a gamble. Like, you know, uh, the comedy club, I mean, I lost money for six, eight months before it made a dime, but I was willing to, I had already gone bankrupt. I'd made sure I had no debt. I had no relationships at the time. You know, I was eating radish sandwiches. I made the sacrifice mm. for me to succeed because I was willing to do that. And like you said earlier, most people don't have that ability 
They want security. For example, yeah. my wife was raised by state workers and, and county employees. Mm. And uh, I showed her a lot of fun and, and changed her life when she was young. But as soon as we sold the club, she went back right back and she now works for the government. So she likes that security. Yeah. You know, she gets the medical. Uh, by the way, I love it now. But yeah, <laughs> the medical coverage yeah. and the regular salary. So I'm off trying things and losing money and having fun. Right. And she brings in the paycheck and has the medical coverage. You know, a lot of my friends in right out of high school went to work for the county or for the state. Mm. And they sat in some cubicle and then they retired oh. at 55. Right. But they've had no fun. Right. So they have more money than me. They probably have more security than me. Right. But I have had way more fun and did so many things that they're in. Well, I don't know if they're envious, but you know what I mean. No, it's, I totally know what you it's mean. It's a different lifestyle. Some people are cubicle people mm -hmm. and some people are not. What part of the audience that we try to hit here is uh, people that have accumulated a degree of wealth that are jumping out of their skin because they can't stand being in that cubicle anymore and are finally willing to chase their dream. So I try to give a little bit of pieces of the puzzle as we go along, if they want to do that, that final well, my advice is find something you care about, something you enjoy, passion. jump yeah. into it. If you're yeah. a musician, you know, open a music store or give lessons or take lessons. Mm. If you if you love food, uh, go work at a restaurant or open a restaurant or take a teach or take a food course. Um, I mean, there, everybody's different. Everybody's unique, but everybody has something that they're passionate about. You got to be passionate. You do, right? because that gives you a uniqueness that you can bring to it. That'll differentiate right. you from your customers. So. For me, whether I was selling lines for my construction company, selling cars or insurance or selling comedy, mm. I was passionate about what I was doing. I cared about the customer. I cared about that customer experience and that kind of um, in, in involvement, that that engagement with your audience or customers or clients is what I thrive off of. And as you mentioned, I get a thrill out of the risk and the challenge of starting a business, whether it's going to make it or not. But advice to people over 50 that are sitting on some cash, get out of the cubicle and go do something. Fun. Now or never. And by the way, you may fail. Most, most companies fail in the first five years. Right. And I certainly had my, my amount of failures, but if you don't ever do it, you're never going to know. Right, right. And there is some kind of crazy statistic that I can't quote verbatim, but something about people. Uh, it was, um, I wrote a blog post about it actually on edwardscom.net, but it was about the Gen X and baby boomers that are actually by far and away the most successful entrepreneurs that fail a lot less than the younger people because they're you know, a little smarter, a little less risky as we get going. So, very important to know. I, I just say it's now or never. If you want to, if you've been thinking your whole life about what if, what if, well, this is our third act and it's, it's, you know, and, and we're pretty young today. 60s, the new 40, right? I mean, it's for sure. <laughs> well, that's so, what I tell everybody. Right. So get out there and try something. Let me, let me ask you something. This is really going back again. I'm jumping around. You can see, I follow a very particular format with these shows. Yeah, I noticed that on your podcast. Yeah. yeah. We talked about the, the woke movement several times here, and especially as it applies to comedy, but boy, as it's applied to business and education, and we've seen what has happened with the, this administration. I'm not, I'm pretty uh, apolitical, uh, a political agnostic, but I've been so fed up with the woke side of things. I was really looking forward to this, these midterms here. And it's been pretty disappointing. Not a not a Republican. I'm not a registered Republican. But boy, was I looking forward to trying to stop what's been going on the last couple of years. Why do you think this hasn't happened? Why do you think the midterms have seemed to be disappointing in this regard? Well, just to be frank with your audience, I am a conservative. I am. Uh, I'm not registered a Republican. So is my I, usual co-host. So we're used to this. Don't worry about so, it. Let it fly. Yeah. But I, I really was shocked. I mean, imagine the people in Pennsylvania 
that picks yeah. Fetterman. Here's a guy that never paid his taxes, never had a job, wants to let all the prisoners out, wants to stop fracking and kill the coal and oil industry. But let's vote for him. I mean, it's just the people wow. of Pennsylvania, to me, have to be absolutely stupid. So send your cards and letters to Barry Edwards, <laughs> not Scott Edwards. But it, what the frick are they thinking? I mean, I'd love to sit some, uh, you know, liberal Democrats down and go name one, one thing the Biden administration's gotten right. Yeah. One. I, totally I mean, they're agree not with right you. about climate change. They're not right on the border. They're not right on the economy. They're not right in the schools. They're not right in, when it comes to police. I mean, it's so frustrating because they failed on every level, and yet so many of these Democratic liberal sheep just follow along like, okay, you're going off the cliff. I guess we'll go with you. Because I cannot understand what the people of Georgia or the people of Pennsylvania are thinking new you york know, california, california oregon new york yep. we're all stupid i mean i'm in california and hate it i'd move in a second if i could <laughs> you know we have governor nuisance i mean it's it's he's like amazing he, he's like a king he just makes makes decisions and because of covid which you know ended a right. year and a half ago and is three years old he still doesn't let the legislature get involved and he just makes mandates it's mm -hmm. like what the frick is this a dictatorship or what mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and yet the people of california and a lot of my peers uh in show business are just blind it's like they have blinders on and i'll ask them i'll say name something anything i'll i'll, I'll give it to you name one thing that's gotten right you know well abortion i go you you don't even understand the the Supreme Court didn't stop abortion. They just said the states made the right. mandate, right. and it's like they're totally glossing over that. But that was a dumb move. I saw that coming a mile away. That this would backfire. That they oh, had well, abortion issue. I don't think it was. Back. I don't know if it was a Republican move or mm. uh, just the law. I mean, it is. Tr I mean, it's true. I think I'm pro-abortion, mm. even though I'm a conservative Republican. Mm. I'm pro-abortion. I don't believe in those people that want to do it all the way up to nine months and stuff. I mean, they're right. killing the baby. So you're with the majority. Somewhere in a three, four month range is about right. The it limit. should be a woman's yeah. choice. Mm -hmm. But the Supreme Court, all they said was they didn't say abortion was good or bad. All they said was it's not a federal matter. I it's think that is matter. technically correct, too. I really do. But I do understand that I thought at the time that it was a pretty bad move for the Republicans because of how that was going to be perceived on mainstream so you think media. It was Republican uh, guidance and not the court going, this is the law. I, I couldn't answer. I, I'll admit that I am not public, uh, politically educated enough to, to stand behind some facts on that. And, but I, I tend to agree that it was a court, decision but yeah republic i mean it just finally got enough republican support that they felt comfortable with doing it i suppose but i felt like it was going to have a lot of blowback i felt like well, that at that moment and again it's because now let's it's let's because be mainstream media is a propaganda arm of the democratic party that's, that's why exactly that's what exactly I what i was talking about if yes. we had mainstream media educating our stupid uh, fellow if they were doing uh, their jobs constituents and yes and saying look they didn't stop abortion they just moved it down to the state right, right. then maybe some of these wackadoodles would understand that okay if we want to fight for what level of abortion we want to allow talk to your state legislature stop yeah. talk to your governor it's all the supreme court said is it's not a federal matter Mm -hmm. And I I don't agree or disagree with what they did. I'm just saying that the press and the liberals and, and stuff took it way, you know, yeah. way, way made it sound way worse than it really was. Totally. And I, to be honest, the Republicans didn't defend it. They weren't clear enough about what's going on. Um, Agreed. You know, but you're right. I think it all comes down to the media. Um, I didn't how do think we have a free country when we have a media that's so obviously controlled by one party or oh, yeah, you know, a oh, certain yeah. area. Yeah, I, I don't get that. You know, I don't it's get it. Like, it's like uh, 
BlackRock Financial saying, we're only going to invest in companies that follow our guidelines. Well, who right. the frick are you? Right. What, who, you know, why do you get to state what mm -hmm. companies should be invested in or not? They, I mean, it's just the whole world's getting a little crazy, Barry. I, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, go start another business. Uh, yes. Yeah. Just to put your energy into something more sane that you can control. I thought that people got wise. I thought the mishandling of this COVID thing was starting to wake people up to CNN brought to you by Pfizer. Uh, probably <laughs> so had some bad so ramifications. True. Yeah. So I really, and I thought more, more and more people, I see the ratings. CNN went off a cliff, no, like yeah. no one's watching them anymore. And millions and millions of people are listening to podcasts where they're getting more unadulterated uh, stuff in, in long form where you can make sense of it yourself rather than a, a seven minute soundbite. So I was quite confident we were going to start turning this around as of uh, as of the last couple of days. And been I've been extremely disappointed to feel that our country, the majority of people are still very bamboozled with the wake movement. They're definitely bamboozled. And do you believe that Nevada and Arizona still haven't counted the ballots and, and are still in the hanging? I mean, how ridiculous. You know, the thing that's so funny is that Biden, if the, the worst thing that I think Biden has done with his whole uh, everything. Afghanistan? The oh, pipeline just, maybe on day one? Oh, uh, just crazy. Yeah. But he has made us look more like a third world country than any other president. He is he has devalued everything. He's inflated everything. He's ruined our in infrastructure, our energy, and mm -hmm. our border. I mean, there's so many things. Our that he's economy. Doing. And you know what's funny? I'm an old guy, Barry. I've been through a lot of good and bad presidents. I've never seen anybody in less than two years. Yeah. I mean, we're we're at the midterms now, but even in the first year. He destroyed so many aspects of this country, yeah. the border, energy, crime, the police. I mean, the way he uh, and his party are trying to run things and the governors in certain uh, Democratic states and stuff and COVID. I mean, it's just I'm a patriot. I love this country. Right. And and it hurts me to see something I care about so much that I think is the best in the was, was the best in the world being yeah. just trashed. I mean, it's just, it, and, and yet there's, you know, we're a split country, which means half our population wants all this failure. Mm, yeah. I, Barry, they don't see it me, as failure. How do they, they do that? They how don't do see they it as failure. It? I don't know. I'm, well, I can say this. You can see it as I'm trying to think from a, a, a leftist perce perception. I, I'm careful with what I say because I used to say liberal. And the fact of the matter is I'm a liberal. I'm a classical liberal. But boy, the left is so far left. They think I'm I'm a Nazi. You know, <laughs> I've been called a Nazi. Have you noticed how fast they turn on people? It is. It's you know, a somebody fact. That's, that's saying what they want. And then as soon as they say something a little different, they yeah. pounce on them. Right. To, and yet to, they say they're the freedom people. To answer your question, you know, I once saw a diagram that I thought was very interesting about how the left and the right are not like this. It's not like left over here, right over here. It's like a horseshoe and they almost meet. And now here's what I'm going to explain. And this is just me talking my theory. But I am absolutely disgusted about the corruption that is infiltrated every aspect of our government, our healthcare system, our food industry, our fossil fuel industry, you name a tech, high tech industry, all in cahoots and just all, I mean, the, it, I, I hate saying it all the time. It sounds corny. The military industrial complex, you know, Biden gets us so messily out of Afghanistan, leaving a hundred billion dollars worth of black hot, hot helicopters over there and all the other stuff. Oh, and I think that he got scolded in order to bring us back into a forever war immediately. And uh, why else are we funding 90% of a war in Europe on yeah. the edge of Europe? Yeah, so we, we, we have no energy, but let's give all our money and all of our, uh, yeah, we're, to our some economies in the tank. Half of it. 
Right. So uh, to explain how the left is justifying. So I was explaining about the corruption that they see, too, with big business. And yet they identify big business with the right, with Republicans. And so they're anti that and they want to tear it down. And I think it, it's just that simple. Now, I but I see it. Well, the, the big business thing is absolutely for sure. But they're also using a woke movement on top of it to create the smokescreen to just continue pilfering the the uh the average everyday american to tell you the truth that's yeah that's my thought what's scary is a lot of the large corporations are so afraid of the woke people yeah that they go along look at united or or coca-cola or yeah it's a lot big companies yeah. that used to be you know uh republican based you know conservatives and now they're so afraid of this counterculture woke society that we might we might offend somebody yeah. if we say go America. So right. then they bend, and it's like you know. Again, this is the entrepreneur in me. I go, you know, the head of Coca Cola, the head of United, the head of whatever company should say, you know what, or Disney, you mm -hmm. know, yeah, we're going to piss off a few people, but the majority of the people the the christian american you know middle america stuff those are our those so we lose a little money but we have some uh you know oh, what's the right word we we care about yeah. Yeah. The, this country and the majority of the people instead of bowing to the few loud people boy I think that's the thing and the media is right. again the media is the problem you're absolutely right about that. What I think was very interesting about your answer is it really is so you. You have explained how with each company from the beginning, you pinpointed, well, the customer is the center of everything. It's the epicenter. So I better start there and end there. And so you just looked at it from a large company's point of view. You better start there and end there as well. But no, for some reason, they're kowtowing to a very small percentage of loud people that really should just be told to shut up and because they don't have any, they don't, nothing's making sense there and they don't have any real power. There is a sense of power to having a mob on Twitter. There is some sense of power. We've seen them destroy people, but we're going to have to get over that and, and write this ship. Or take the risk. Take you know, the risk. You know, if, if Disney or any of these companies say, look, uh, we respect that you have an opinion. And if you want to come to our amusement parks, We'd be happy to have you and feel inclusive, but we're not going to piss off the whole country. Right. Well, they did. They we're going to piss off the whole country and change things and say things uh, like we want CRT in our schools and stuff <sighs> because we're trying to appease this 3% of the population over here. Such a huge mistake. Absolutely. So many people I know. I mean, I, for one, sold my Disney stock. A lot of people sold their Disney stock. Mm -hmm. We haven't been to Disneyland in several years. The, the, the management is trying so hard to appease the 3%. They're losing the 97%. Mm -hmm. And they're so blinded that they don't see it. And it's again, amazing. I still think it goes back to everyone's afraid of the woke media. That's exactly right. And Netflix has suffered the consequences from uh, going oh, woke. Yeah. And have been... CNN. It's yes, I mean, nobody Santa. watches CNN. Gillette, do you remember a few years back, maybe about five, and they did this big, long, toxic masculinity commercial? Gillette, they create freaking razors. And they did this whole toxic masculinity commercial. I looked it up recently. They lost their ass on that. It was a huge backfire, but they were trying to I, appease, identify, and kowtow to these people. Why? That was so dumb. How did you? How did a marketing department draw that up and present it to the board and say, this is going to be a great idea? I, th those things amaze me. The, the stupidity that we have run this country with lately is... It, you know, it all depends on conviction and uh, the salesperson's commitment. I mean, look at the guy that first walked into a, a TV producer and said, I've got this show. It's called Hogan's Heroes, and it's about the Nazis, and it's a comedy. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> that is funny. <laughs> that was a great show, by the way. I love that growing up. But I mean, you know, talk about a sales job. Right, right. No, yeah, yeah, very true. So, but that's a way to show somebody your vision and get through it. 
want to start winding up, but I got to come back to this. Barry, the bar, the Billy, uh, Bill Maher story. Yes, that was what I was coming back to. You mentioned, you said you fired Bill Maher. Bill Maher was a regular at my club. Very smart guy. Very funny guy. A bit of a, a an asshole. A bit. So of he's a, really young at this a, point. Oh yeah, he's in his twenties, and he's mm. nobody knows who he is. Okay. Um, but he, he has an opinion on everything, and but he was funny, uh, yeah. and I liked Barry. But it, but he worked be Bill. for me a few times. Bill, I mean, he'd worked for me a few times, and uh, and then he came to the club, and it was like a Thursday night, and there was maybe fifty people in the audience, and he goes out, and he made a fatal mistake in entertainment. And that is he believed the stage was and the audience were there for him Mm. as opposed for he as entertainer being there for the audience, right? Mm. They paid money to be entertained. He forgot that he went out and started spewing his political stuff and he's name dropping politicians in DC and, and people in the legislature. Well, the common person may not know this senator from this house representative, right? Um, And he was just talking over the heads of the audience instead of entertaining them. And it might've been really funny stuff, but he was, you know, maybe too aware, too smart, whatever you want to say. But the point is he's halfway through a set. He's not getting very much response because he's not engaging with the audience. He hasn't connected at all. He stops looks right at the audience and goes, you guys are stupid. Oh my God. You don't know what the, you know, what the hell's going on in this world. I'm I'm not going to waste my time on you. And he walked off stage. Oh and my I'm God. Like, I'm this boss. I'm his producer. I go, what the fuck? Excuse my language. That's what funny. do you think you're doing? They paid to be entertained. It's your job to entertain them. You're not paid as an educator. You're not paid to have an, your opinion. You're there to entertain you forgot that you're fired. Get your ass out of here. So I paid him for the two nights he worked. Never saw him again. Wow. He went on to huge success. He which did. Which is great for him. He he's found his funny, audience. He's very smart. Yeah. But he's an asshole. And yeah, he, he's and still he's, arrogant. Oh, arrogance is, you know, with a capital A. Yeah. Yeah. But I, that, was, that was my point. I've told that story several times because I want people to understand that whether you're a salesman trying to take give good customer service to a, a client or a customer, or you're a producer and you're trying to provide an hour and a half entertainment show to an audience of people that paid to be entertained, they have an expectation mm. to have a good time. It's my job as the producer to ensure that they get what they're paid for. And when an entertainer forgets that the stage isn't his soapbox to spout whatever crap he wants. It's his right. job to entertain. And they forget that they don't belong on my stage. Well, I mean, put it quite simply, we've made the point a few times on this podcast. You had your success by pinpointing your audience, your customer, starting there and ending there. They're the epicenter. And he didn't recognize that. But perhaps he learned from that because he bounced back, you know, he found his well, audience. Know. I don't know if he learned from it. He ended up having great success. Yeah. He's a very yeah. smart guy. He's had his he's own show. Smart. He's he's he could buy and sell me a hundred times over. I just think, and I it would be good to he, hear that he learned something from it. Mm-hmm. I think he's so uh, arrogant. I don't think he did. I think he thought mm-hmm. I was an idiot, just like my audience, mm-hmm. and didn't care mm-hmm. what I thought. But um, that's just one person, you know. I mean, I I had. Hundreds of comics worked for me. Some were great. Some were not. Uh, some were very respectful of the stage and the audience, and some weren't. But as the producer, it was my job to protect the audience and entertain the audience. And to me, that always came first. Mm-hmm. And I worked my butt off to make sure they always got quality shows. And I got a chance to to really do that. Uh, people from Soupy Sales and Pat Paulson to Tommy Chong and Graham Chapman and Monty Python uh, Robin Williams, uh, Tom Hanks, all these people graced my stage and I feel like they all got something from it. And I know I did. Oh, nice, nice, nice. Now with that, I don't want to forget, I believe you got a book out there. 
right? I've got two, but oh, okay. uh, actually three I've written. But the, the, book, the book that I'd like to promote, if it's okay, Barry, sure. is called 20 Questions Answered About Being a Stand-Up Comic. Um, 10 that you have to know, 10 that you should know. It's available on Amazon and at the uh, uh, Book Baby Bookshop. It is a uh, good, got some good cartoons. It's it's a short form book that teaches the basics. If you want to go from amateur to professional, or if you just want to try getting on stage, there's even a chapter on stage fright. Uh, it's a great book, and uh, I appreciate you giving me an opportunity uh, to to share it. Twenty questions answered about being a stand up comic. Anybody in your life interested in in comedy as an art form, this is a good lesson book. I like that. And uh want to mention that your website is, is standupyourhostandmc.com. Did I say that? That's right? actually the podcast. Oh, okay. Stand Sorry. Up Comedy, your host and MC. And I interview famous and not so famous comics. And there's a lot of great comedy nice. show material from all my years. I had TV shows and concerts and radio shows. I'm going to but subscribe to that. Yeah. If you want to get it all in one place, it's Scott's comedy. Uh, yeah, Scott's. <laughs> I'm looking at it. Scott's comedy stuff. Dot com. com. Right. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a good. I have it up right now. I'm looking at your website. Uh, anything else that you'd like to plug? I will put all these links in the in the podcast show notes regardless. Well, I, I feel like I'm pushing a bit, Barry, but you're there's not a brand new thing because I always like to start new projects. Uh, it's the entrepreneur of me. Um, I love stand up comedy podcasts. So I created the standup comedy podcast network.com standup comedy podcast network.com if you go to that you'll find 16 different podcasts that were done created by standup comics there's videos from the old days of Bob Saget Gary Shandlin Dana Carvey there's audio bites there's even a joke of the day so it's a great website for anybody interested in standup comedy Okay, standupcomedypodcastnetwork.com. I will be checking that out as well. I hope you do, Barry. And by the way, thanks for having me on your show. I've had a blast. I, I am over 50, and yep. uh, I appreciate yep. that you're uh, bringing some great conversation and value to uh, your listeners, and thank you for your time. Dude, I had the best time, and especially like the way you, you roll with whatever the hell I say. We got into that whole political thing. That was a lot of fun. I like your perspective on stuff. So maybe we should revisit this uh, someday in the near future. At any time, sir. It'd be my All pleasure. Right. And catch me at edwardscom.net and at over50startingover.com. Sign up there to our email list and get all this in your email box as it happens. All right, Scott, I will email you and let you know when this comes out. It'll likely be tomorrow. Sounds great. I'll be happy to promote it on social media and I'll send you that early commercial with Bob Saget. That's and right. if you're interested, I've got a really cool video of uh, Dana Carvey doing chopping broccoli two years before he was on Saturday Night Live. I love to see that. That sounds awesome. <laughs>